Hey, blessings to you. It's Mike Miano. I am the pastor here at the Blue Point Bible Church, the director of the Power of Preterism Network, and the apologist through MGW Apologetics, where the goal is to encourage the saints, the Church of God, if you will, uh, to have a zeal empowered by knowledge, uh, rather than having a zeal without knowledge, having uh, no knowledge, no zeal, and all the other alternatives. So uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. This is a sort of off-the-cuff uh, podcast program here, video cast, if you will, uh, that I wanted to offer up, uh, talking a little bit about the idea of Pretergate, which I'll get in on the definition here in a moment. Uh, it was just last year, basically around this time, that I began posting about Pretergate, and uh, I decided it was important to talk a little bit about that, uh, talk about what we're seeing uh, within the theological, Christian theological community right now, and uh, hopefully encourage you a bit and uh, give you some resources that uh, would definitely benefit you. So thank you for being here. Uh, if you can share this video, please, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do the same as I look here on social media and make sure we're streaming. Uh, I know I'm streaming through my own personal Facebook page at this point. Uh, that was just basically to uh, be able to communicate with those of you that uh, tune into my regular posts on social media. I very much appreciate you and wanted to make sure that I uh, extended, you know, more appreciation. I know on Zoom, uh, folks that tune into my uh, Facebook don't always get notified. So I wanted to make sure uh, that tonight was a little bit different. Uh, I think that's important in our uh, understanding of uh, doing ministry and doing things is sometimes we need to do something different. It was Mark Batterson actually who said um, change of pace plus change of pace, change of place plus change of pace equals change of perspective. So uh, this is me sort of leaning in on that if you will. So thank you again for tuning in. Uh, I do want to talk to us tonight about Predergate. Uh, this idea, I've been posting about it. There's a, a hashtag, if you will, that I've created. Over the years, uh, I've created some hashtags that I think are important to use and share. And uh, if we're talking about social media and the effectiveness of uh, effectivity, if you will, of um, our sharing and posting, uh, hashtags lend, lend to uh, people just can simply click on the hashtag and find a host of different things posted by that hashtag. And uh, some that I've used... Uh, would be the power of preterism, full preterism, and also Pretergate more recently. So um, let me lean in on talking about that a bit. So yes, uh, last year, excuse me, uh, around this time, I literally posted this comment. Some have asked, what is Pretergate? It's a semi-humorous phrase to highlight the scandal that full preterism is demonstrating in the contemporary church, Christian church, Christianity, if you will. The scandal of those avoiding the truth of fulfilled Bible prophecy and those working against it. It's a great time. It's a great day. It's a great moment, if you will, to see the heyday of full preterism being demonstrated. And of course, in Acts chapter 5, verse 39, we read, But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. And that's Acts chapter 5 verse 39. So uh, just last year I explained that and uh, unfortunately yet fortunately we're seeing that same heyday of full preterism continuing in the Christian community, Christian church. Unfortunately Pretergate continues. Uh, we continue to see the inconsistency uh, offered up by those that would rather cleave to traditions, creeds, uh, not answering the responses, maybe removing people from the assembly and then talking about how they wish they could talk to a full preterist and ask these questions. Uh, just strange uh, things that continue within the Christian community in regards to uh, the effect, the power of preterism, if you will, uh, the hermeneutic of preterism. And uh, then we also see, unfortunately, the continuing non-willingness of many to grow in our theology. And again, this is across the board, whether it's full preterists, preterists, partial preterists, uh, futurists, full futurists, dispensationalists, uh, whatever you know ilk one might find themselves of. So for years, I've called for Reformation Now, which is basically a humbling effort of saying, uh, we don't know it all. We need to continue 
to uh, reform our own understandings and be willing to challenge ourselves to seek, search, study, and prove. Many of you know I often bring up that moniker, uh, that phrase, if you will, uh, to encourage us because each of them of, of, are of the scriptures. Seek, search, study, and prove the things of God. That's what we are called to. Uh, if I may bring up some points uh, in that regard, uh, the Latin phrase, semper reformanda ecclesia est. Uh, that Latin phrase means the church is to be always reforming, always reformed, uh, you know, the church uh, continues or something like that, something to that effect. But either way, uh, the point stands that the church is to be an institution that is demonstrating what it looks like to always reform, to always be willing to take on new ideas and challenges and say, how does that square away with the truth that we've come to know about Jesus our Lord, the truth that has been revealed to us, the truth that is contained within Scripture. And uh, we are a community that should be able to have responses, should be able to uh, be consistent in the things that we're saying. And unfortunately, the reason why we highlight that phrase Predergate is because we see so many working against that. And, and uh, as I said more recently, uh, that it seems some have a ministry devoted to confusion uh, rather than clarity. Uh, or uh, it's a ministry that's been kind of surrounded by bullies that make them lean a certain direction. There's all sorts of ideas uh, that kind of lend to why we're seeing Predergate take uh, place within our society. So uh, I mentioned Semper Reformanda Ecclesia Est, that Latin phrase, which again, I think is so important that we need to be a people who are always reforming. If the church itself, uh, the corporate institution is called to be always reforming, that would mean the individuals within the church are also called to be always reforming. So may we be a people, again, that challenge ourselves to seek, search, study, and prove the things of God to the best of our ability, chasing after what I like to call a zeal empowered by knowledge. Um, I think of a quote by Clark Pinnock. He's a uh, reformed theologian. And Clark Pinnock said this, we cannot rest content with mere reiteration of earlier insights. A theology which seeks only to restate the system of some honored theological forerunner is less than fully biblical because theology is a creative act. It cannot rest content with mere reiteration of earlier insights. So uh, as our brother Don Preston, Dr. Don K. Preston would say, uh, catch the power of that. Uh, what Clark is challenging us to is to always be a people that are chasing after truth and how the truth applies in our generation and, uh, you know, and, and really going for that and, and chasing after that uh, idea of zeal empowered by knowledge rather than being a people like Hosea had lamented and, and you know, uh, um, prophesied against, if you will, um, that they had no knowledge, right? They had, a, there was a lack of knowledge. Uh, then we see the Apostle Paul say in Romans chapter 10, uh, he says that these people have a zeal for God, the Jews, uh, that but their zeal is not based upon knowledge. Their zeal, unfortunately, was based upon tradition. So um, we know that we need to be a people that are constantly chasing after and seeking after a hermeneutic of seeking, seeking searching, studying, and proving. Uh, each of those, again, being connected with some scriptures that you can find. One of my favorites being the, the prove all things, hold fast to that which is good and abstain from that which is wicked or inconsistent or uh, confusing or the host of other uh, things that stand against what we, the church, we as Christians are called to represent uh, that unfortunately find their way into our hermeneutics and, and Christian ideas and churches and uh, ecclesiology, if you will. So, if I may just mention some resources at the beginning of this uh, sort of video cast, uh, what I would mention would be um, the Preterist Power Hour, of course. Uh, many of you know I serve, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I serve as the director for the Power of Preterism Network. You can go to powerofpreterism.com to learn more about that effort. One of the ministries we do through that network is the Preterist Power Hour. and. Uh, what we do with the Preterist Power Hour is the first Monday of the month, uh, we offer a live session at 10.30 a.m. Uh, then uh, on the last Friday of the month, we offer a live session that actually streams live. The one on the first Monday is simply a sort of back room, um, I, you know, brainstorming, if you will, sharing of thoughts and perspectives, fellowshipping with one another. 
and uh, we do that first Monday, last Friday uh, at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. Uh, and then what we also offer up is what we call a strategy sheet. And the strategy sheet usually has resources, uh, which would be, which would include, but not, but are not limited to books, podcasts, interviews, and reviews uh, of different things that are happening within preterism, uh, be it social media posts, conferences, books, uh, and, and again, a host of other things that are happening within the preterist community, the Christian community. And uh, I like to make sure we're all aware of those things, conferences that are happening. So I encourage you visit our most recent strategy sheet. You will be encouraged. If you visit our blog site, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, uh, you can find it. Simply go to Google, put in Power of Preterism, and I'm sure it will lead you there. So uh, some things I want to definitely make mention of tonight also would be uh, Gary DeMar's podcast. And again, his podcast is literally called the Gary DeMar podcast. So it's not too hard to find if you go to Google and just plug it in. Uh, some of us have you know, the ability. We don't even need to go to Google. You just go to your search bar at the top of your screen, and it'll bring you right to uh, what you need to find. So uh, the Gary DeMar podcast, I'm going to lean in on that a little bit uh, during our discussion this evening. Uh, I want to talk about that. As many of you know, Gary DeMar had a lot to do with the idea of Predergate last year with uh, the three questions that were posed to him, uh, you know, and the charges of heresy and removing him from conferences. He actually mentioned that on one of his more recent uh, podcasts that I'll be leaning in on here in a moment. So uh, definitely a resource to be reviewing. I'm always encouraged by Gary. Uh, I'm always challenged by Gary, and yes, I'll admit I'm frustrated by Gary uh, when it comes to his dealing with some of these important issues. So again, I'll mention more about that here in a moment. Um, Tim Martin has really done a great effort with beyondcreationscience.com uh, with the more recent Covenant Creation YouTube channel, so I encourage you to go ahead and find that, follow that. I know he's been uploading some of his sermons and different resources that uh, you'll be encouraged by and challenged by. So definitely go ahead and subscribe, like the channel, do whatever it is to uh, make yourself more aware of what's being posted there. Uh, Ward Fenley with NCMI Live has you know, continued to just pump out some great podcasts, and he'll be a, a part of our discussion this evening. Some things were mentioned that brought up his ministry and his efforts, uh, things he's talked about before. Uh, so I want to go ahead and highlight that, NCMI Live uh, on YouTube. Then you have a uh, you know, of importance in the preterist community would be William Bell doing a debate on the resurrection tonight. So uh, I, I haven't had the chance to review that, but I know it happened. So I want to encourage all of you to go ahead and find your way over to William Bell's uh, posts. I just want to go ahead and acknowledge, uh, I see Cindy's here with us from Atlanta. Thank you, Cindy, for tuning in. Spiro, yes, I see you. Thank you for being here in our session. And um, hopefully you're, each of you have a notebook and are sharing these podcasts and programs. Uh, as I often don't stream live through Facebook, but I'm hoping you might share the video and uh, the audience might be widened quite a bit. So uh, again, just jumping back in on some of the resources, William Bell's doing his debate tonight. So if you go over to his channel or go to Don's channel, Don Preston, and uh, you find them on Facebook, uh, you can find the links to the debate being shared. Uh, I saw just a brief moment of William having a, a, a post on the uh, screen about, you know, a, a what would it be a chart if you will uh, a graphic that explained the resurrection of the dead so i'm sure he did a great job as he's a teacher a giant if you will that i stand upon his shoulders in regards to the resurrection of the dead so uh don preston's planning some debates i know behind the scenes i've had some discussion with him and then holger neubauer as well uh international debate so i mean that's pretty exciting uh, we see more and more things happening internationally with the truth of preterism, the power of preterism. So uh, rejoice in that. And, and then, of course, there are conferences. The only two that I know of so far, and many of you know I'm big on trying to get everybody aware and on, on notice about the conferences, uh, the two that I'm aware of regarding preterism this year so far would be in August, and that's uh, Steve Magwa's conference, Pastor Steve Ask the Pastor, uh, in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, that's August 2nd through the 4th, 2024. So uh, definitely connect with Pastor Steve Magua uh, on Facebook. I believe he's under Steve Magua. YouTube, Ask the Pastor Steve Magua. Uh, definitely get in touch with him. Uh, and just for clarity's sake, M-A-G-U-A is his uh, last name, Magua, uh, that I'm pronouncing there. So go ahead and dig up his resources and look forward to that conference. Uh, God willing, I'll be there and get to meet you if you're there, and you'll rejoice in all that we learn and talk about. So 
Uh, then you also have the Arkansas Eschatology Conference happening August 23rd through the 24th. I believe Gary DeMar is one of the speakers and a host of other great full preterist uh, teachers as well. So um, you definitely want to be looking into that. I know Zach Davis is one of the point men for that uh, discussion. So find him on Facebook. Uh, go ahead and just Google the Arkansas Eschatology Conference happening in August 2024. And I'm sure you'll find the uh, information you need. Uh, so definitely look into that a bit uh, and be there. I'm hoping to be there, God willing, as well. I know they said the hotel rooms and space is filling up. So get on it as soon as possible. Uh, so all of that said, that's I, I think I've given you enough. I've, I, hopefully I've given you quite a bit to write down already. But I want to just lean in on some things that, again, surround this topic of Predergate and, and what we're saying here about inconsistent theology, those that kind of cleave to... Uh, ideas that were shared in the past rather than growing with the times, if you will, uh, and acknowledging previous discussions and fellowship that's been had around certain truths that need to change other truths. That's Reformation. When we realize we've learned something or we've acknowledged a truth that requires, yes, changing the way we viewed other things as well. And that has a big part of this preterism conversation, pretergate, if you will. And, uh, Gary's really been a big part of that conversation. So I want to take you back. I want to take you back to last week. And again, this actually brings us back, I think, about a year and a half ago here, where uh, Gary had done some presentations that you can find on YouTube under the title, Far As the Curse is Found. So uh, let me give you some background before I get in on the post. I do review every year. And uh, as I began to do my review of 2023, I found myself looking at some of our efforts through the Preterist Power Hour, where we were doing a program or doing a series called Getting Into Genesis 3. And obviously, you know, Genesis 3 talks about the curse. Uh, so around the Christmas season, I know Ward always talks about joy to the world and highlights a, a exegesis, if you will, of that hymn uh, and highlights that, you know, it's one of the more preteristic uh, hymns that are out there, uh, joy to the world, you know, the Lord has come, uh, and, uh, you know, it gets in on some great points. So this idea that we find within that hymn, far as the curse is found, uh, you know, that just intrigued me for the, you know, my review, and I plugged it into YouTube, uh, far as the curse is found, preterist. And I knew Ward Fenley's resources would pop up because, again, he's done uh, a series, and I've posted about this years ago, uh, Joy to the World. And he's always, around the Christmas season, kind of looks at the, the idea of the Christmas season and how that might uh, help folks understand or see the importance of preterist truth. So I, uh, I began to do some research, and then, again, I found this YouTube uh, about three or four lectures, or, yeah, two or three, uh, lectures by Gary DeMar, uh, regarding uh, the far as the curse is found. So uh, I'll just share what I posted on social media here, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of what I wanted to share with you regarding Predergate. So Gary, uh, this is what I posted. He goes on to great lengths, speaking about Gary's lecture, to demonstrate the falsehood of dispensationalism and common ignorance regarding time statements and audience relevance. I can surely appreciate that. However, in part two, he says... Not, and this is a quote, direct quote here. Not all Jews rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah. The Jews did not reject Jesus. It was mostly the hierarchy, the establishment, that rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah. They are the ones who brought Jesus before Pilate because they knew they could not use the religious arguments against Jesus. So they brought political arguments. It was necessary for Jesus to separate the unbelievers and the believers to basically get rid of the old covenant order. And that was with the destruction of Jerusalem that took place in AD 70. Now, the full preterist says everything ended. Everything ended for the world at large after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. There's really nothing yet to experience as Christians and to be involved in the world. Yes, you can do all of that. But things will just keep going on and on and on. Because according to them, Israel's eschatology is our eschatology. End quote. So that's what Gary said. And uh, then I continued here and I said what he later calls world eschatology. I wouldn't keep, or I, excuse me, what I posted here it continues. And I said I couldn't keep count regarding how many times Gary said that the New Testament eschatology 
is Israel's eschatology. So where do we find our eschatology? Uh, this world eschatology that Gary speaks of. What exactly needs to end in the post-AD 70 world, as he calls it? What full preterist believes what Gary is saying? None of the hundreds of full preterists that I network with, uh, rather full preterists say that the old covenant order ended and that there is a whole lot of healing, growth, and opportunity for Christians to experience since the time not one stone was left. And since that's true, it's good news that things just keep going on and on and on. So I posted that now just to give some background here. Hopefully you would notice I did not post that to engage Gary DeMar in conversation, nor to get a response from him. I believe he had said enough. Uh, my charge was more so toward the full, toward the full preterist community uh, regarding what Gary had said and who believes this and why do they believe this? Uh, and kind of a challenge that you, you know I, I don't understand what he thinks needs what he thinks needs to uh, end uh, in this post AD seventy world that he calls it. So Gary responded. And again, I tagged him on social media. You know, uh, I think that's important to acknowledge that these are his teachings and to be accountable to our teachings and encourage, you know, not accountable in a way that, uh, you know, is charging one with heresy, but accountable in a way that is allowing others to have conversation around what you said. I think that's important. I appreciate what uh, Pastor Dave Curtis of Brian Bible Church, it seems as though at the end of every one of his services, he allows for some uh, back and forth banter, discussion. I know some local pastors here on Long Island that have done the same thing. And I think that's such a beautiful ethos uh, to develop within our, our communities, our church communities, uh, to just have talkbacks, if you will, uh, and respond to some of the points and make sure people are understanding uh, or at least gaining some resources for further understanding uh, and you know doing that. So I appreciate that very much. And, uh, you, you know, so Gary responded, and I want to appreciate that. However, this wasn't necessarily for him to respond. And, and what Gary initially responded with was this, and I'm going to share with you kind of a back and forth that we had on social media, which again, I think lends to this idea of Predergate, uh, where we're, we're hoping for a greater consistency, a greater growth within the Christian community, uh, not cleaving to uh, that, that idea that Clark Pinnock had highlighted where uh, we're just reiterating previous thoughts. So sure enough, Gary responds with, my 30 chapter book, God and Government, spells it out in great detail what comes next post AD 70. Now folks, double back to what I shared with you. I didn't ask what happens after AD 70. I asked what needs to end in a post AD 70 world. I don't know so many preterists that ask questions like, uh, you know, what needs to come after AD 70? Because we've done conferences and we've had interviews and resources galore that have highlighted these things. So nobody was asking what happens after AD 70, uh, what comes next? But Gary, again, responded with his book, God and Government, which again was a previous thought that he shared, uh, not so much since He's been having discussions within the full preterist community the way that he has, going to conferences, being in pictures, uh, being speaker at different conferences. So, uh, you know, again, I think we're asking now that you've come to admit some of these things, now can you interact with these truths? What would you say about things you've said years past or even months ago? Uh, so that, that was simply the idea here. So I had responded and I said, Gary, that was not the question. I asked what needs to end in the post AD 70 world. Also, could you tell me what full preterist believes what you had asserted? Can you admit that as false after visiting and prayerfully learning a bit at the Berean Bible Church? Which again, he was in a conference there, he spoke there, he was in pictures there talking with other full preterists. So I imagine he's heard a different idea. I know some of these people personally. Again, I mentioned that I've networked with some of these people. So I just wanted to see some honesty from Gary and, and kind of uh, challenge him a bit uh, to admit, you know, humbly admit that he's been wrong. I've done that on podcasts and programs. I know a lot of great teachers and leaders in the Christian community that have done that, and it benefits many. It benefits the person, if you will. Let me get off my uh, pulpit here preaching about that. So Gary goes on to say, I still don't know what you're getting at. So I said, let me break this down. This is my response. In speaking about full preterism, again, highlighting this discussion that I mentioned in that uh uh, you know, post, uh, far as the curse is found. In speaking about full preterists, you said, number one, quote, 
because, according to them, Israel's eschatology is our eschatology. So I ask you, where do we find our eschatology? What needs to end in the post-AD 70 world? Number two, quote, Now the full preterist says everything ended. Everything ended for the world at large after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. There's really nothing yet to experience as Christians and to be involved in the world, end quote. Can you now, this is what I'm asking, you know, Gary, now that he's engaged in this discussion, can you now, after visiting with other full preterists, who I know full well wouldn't agree with that, admit that that's a false statement regarding the worldview of full preterism? He went on to respond to other people on the post, just ignored my post, the discontinued conversation with me. Meanwhile, it's my post. So then I said, why are you avoiding my simple questions? Do I not deserve a response? And he had made a post where he said that he doesn't have an interest in interacting with Israel only, which again is more in line with the things he's asserting here. That's not full preterism. That's Israel only. That's its own designation. So, uh, you know, he's not interested in responding to Israel only, which I'm not. Uh, not uh, responding to flat earthers, which I'm not. Uh, and he, you know, and then I said that I do my best to serve faithfully in the local congregation and to continue the cause of the gospel, uh, which again, I believe requires seeking, searching, studying, and proving these things in a contemporary fashion, interacting with the truth as we grow into it and reform the church and, and deal with these different ideas and truths. So Gary responded and he said, I don't know how to answer them because they don't make sense to me regarding my questions. My books on eschatology explain what ended in AD 70, the Old Covenant Order. I don't know what full preterists believe what I'm saying. I've never asked anyone. I don't concern myself with these type of issues. I deal with topics as needed and let the remnant pick up on them and apply them. See Gary North's comments on the remnant, which again, uh, you know, I appreciate what he said there uh, that uh, I guess he, um, he feels that although he's already explained these things, uh, I was hoping for a little bit more conversation post-interacting with full preterism. So uh, then I said, well, perhaps you should stop talking about full preterism. Uh, as you did in part two of your presentation, you said, uh, you know, as the curse is found, you spoke like an expert because he keeps saying that he's not an expert. Well, uh, you know, he spoke like an expert. Uh, then he went on to say, I don't know what full preterists believe what I'm saying. How would I know if, uh, if full preterists believe what I'm saying? I don't have to be an expert on full preterism to make that statement. And definition and definition which definitionally which full preterists. Uh, and then I responded, I said, I've listened and read too much from you uh, for you to be this dull. These are your direct words. Quote, now the full preterist says everything ended, everything ended for the world at large after the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. There's really nothing yet to experience as Christians and to be involved in in the world. Yes, you can do all of that but things just keep going on and on and on, end quote. Where did you get that idea? You spent time at the Berean Bible Church and time with the Burroughs of Berea podcast, some of which are full preterists. I personally know many of them whom would not agree with that statement. I was asking uh, where you got such an idea and how you would change that statement after learning, the, uh, you know, learning from and with some full preterists. Uh, how and why is this so complicated for you? So then he went on to say, one of the reasons I was invited to speak uh, on the subject was because of the statement like this that were being made to those who associate with some full preterist. That's the context. That's why I was there. It's not something I raised. Uh, my response was that those are your words. Uh, you said that. Go back and listen to the first four minutes of your presentation. Clearly, you're not willing to admit that that's not correct regarding full preterism. You made a false statement and I was asking for clarity. You have now made this even more confusing and dismaying. And if I may just insert this point here, uh, you know, in my discussion with many, even some local leaders and pastors uh, regarding full preterism, what I constantly see is this idea that rather than engaging the truth, they just want to kind of paint a straw man and, and have their own discussions. And that frustrates me to no end. I said to someone just last night, that uh, nothing's worse than someone lying, you know, or, or the only thing I hate more than lying would be those that, um, you know, talk about my view without interacting with it, you know, that you kind of create a false character, if you will, of what I'm saying, uh, which again is pretty much lying uh, otherwise uh, and false truth. So that being said, um, you know, I just want Gary to uh, respond to these things. 
Um, I'm noticing that someone's saying it's cutting out. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm double checking on my internet status. All right, well, it seems like I have full uh, bars here, and I want to appreciate uh, Greg. Thank you for tuning in. I hope I'm uh, encouraging you with some of my thoughts. And then, Joe, I uh, appreciate you as well. Spiro, I hope that uh, it clears up uh, on your end. So, um, and I'll most likely post a blog about this somewhere where I'll share most of the resources that I'm bringing up here and, and things that I think lead to this conversation or lend to this conversation of Predergate. So, I think it's important to uh, be talking about and considering. So, uh, you know, again, going back to this point here, um, you know, my goal was for Gary just to, not even for Gary, now that he engaged this conversation, now for him to clarify his thoughts. But my initial goal was to simply highlight that full preterists don't believe these things, that this is a false idea regarding full preterism. Uh, so then Gary uh, went on to say, uh, I was asked to address what full preterists had said to those who invited me not to me, and I did that and more. Since I don't hang out with full preterists, my invitation was based on what others were hearing. Uh, then I said, okay, so you, you were asked to substantiate hearsay, uh, which you did, that and more. Well, hopefully a year later, here we are, January 2024, uh, you realize that you made an erroneous statement regarding full preterism. Uh, that's the point of this post aiming to promote clarity and re regarding what full preterists are actually saying and believing, if you will, myself being a full preterist and networking with hundreds of others, simply on the chase to uh, find, you know, these full preterists that believe this and call them out, uh, you know, and I know, again, it's Israel only, it's not full preterism. So we need to, if we're saying full preterists, we need to correct ourselves. You're using the title erroneously. So uh, then Gary went on to say, then I suggest you contact the people who asked me to address the topic. By the way, such a view is common in a lot of circles, as I also pointed out and have pointed out why uh, in a, when I wrote God and Government. I've also heard that some full preterists believe from some very reliable people who are connected with some full preterists. Uh, I've spent enough time with you on this topic. I also suggest you come up with a unified definition of full preterism uh, that all full preterists agree on. Well, you know, obviously we know that that's like saying, can we find a unified definition of Christianity that all Christians would agree upon uh, or eschatology that all Christians would agree upon? Obviously, we know that that's not possible. So when it comes to uh, full preterism. Uh, I've written a book more recently, the Full Preterism. You can go to thefullpreteristbook.com, order your copy. I actually am coming out with the audio book in the next couple weeks, so I might encourage you to hang on and wait for that. I think you'll be greatly encouraged to listen to me uh, go through the book and uh, shout out to, uh, what is it, Long Island Sounds, uh, uh, the local studio here and, and the efforts of uh, Damien and many others that uh, led in on helping me uh, understand, you know, understand the way that a good audio might work and, and had done the effort of putting it together. So look forward to that in more recent uh, weeks. So um, getting back to this point here, uh, I, I think I have worked toward, you know, an idea that full preterists agree upon. I think we have a decent sized network uh, of folks that have kind of, you know, led to the lend you know, led in on this conversation and I've talked about these things. So uh, I then just appreciated Gary. I said, thank you for responding. A bit perplexing of a response, but I appreciate your time and attention. Have a blessed evening. Happy New Year. Uh, and I am grateful for his teachings and efforts. And uh, then Gary responded to Jeff Vaughn, continued the conversation. Uh, you know, which view of full preterism? Who are the representatives? Uh, what is the concept of full preterism? And, you know, I think most people know who are the representatives within full preterism. Uh, you know, you, you know when you're getting into sort of aberrant ideas. You know, I would say that a lot of folks are, uh, especially within like Israel only and a lot of these groups, uh, covenant creation, if you will, um, are honest regarding their idea, their, their perspective in that regard. So they're not hiding it. Uh, so you usually know if you're talking to somebody that's talking about something outside the bounds of what we would call full preterism. Uh, again, I don't agree with Israel, only I do agree with covenant creation, uh, but again, I admit that that's an understanding I have, rather than concealing it or hiding it uh, to blend in with others. So uh, I just think that's very important, and I think we know who the representatives are within full preterism, uh, that idea, and we know the distinctions and differences. It seems like Gary needs to kind of catch up uh, if we're going to call him a leader there and a teacher. So, uh, you know, I just think that's important. Nemo, I'm glad you're here. God bless you. 
uh, watching from Kenya. That's encouraging, and uh, I'm glad that it's loud and clear. Uh, Greg asked, does Israel only even consider themselves as Christians? And, you know, and, and yes and no. Uh, it depends who you talk to. Israel only is not as uh, unified of an idea as most folks want to uh, posit it. So uh, I think that that, you know, most folks that are kind of lean in on Israel only, I think, tend to be practical atheists, uh, which, again, you might even say the same for a lot of Christians, uh, you know, in the way they believe and understand things. So um, I think it was Greg Groeschel uh, that wrote a book. Uh, Craig Groeschel, that's what it is. Craig Groeschel uh, wrote a book years ago about the Christian atheist, if you will. So, uh, you know, just kind of using that to help us understand that a lot of Christians live in this idea of practical atheism and I think that Israel only is just building on top of that and uh, using the preterist hermeneutic to further establish more confusion in that regard so uh, I've you know talked about that at times before uh, I'd love to you know develop that conversation a bit further with you Greg uh, in uh, you know some conversations maybe back room and then publicly if we feel that we want to go public and talk about it a bit so um, you know I think enough has been said about Israel only to really help push it outside the bounds of what full preterism is actually saying, what most full preterists are teaching in regards to a kingdom and biblical worldview. So uh, we need to recognize that that's just the distinction that majority of full preterists actually disagree with. So then uh, Gary went on to say, well, n now catch this. So now the next day, uh, Gary releases a podcast. And, you know, I don't know when he recorded it, but it, he said a lot of interesting things that definitely uh, highlighted some of the things that were being revealed on my post. Uh, and I'll just share a couple things with you, and that's what I wanted to do. I would encourage you to listen to the podcast yourself. Uh, go to the Gary DeMar podcast, as I mentioned at the beginning, and uh, you can find you know the more recent podcasts. Uh, not the most recent two, but uh, let's say uh, two prior to that. Uh, one regarding what now, and talking about full preterism, and then the next one regarding God's law. I'm going to highlight those two podcast and some things that I think need to be highlighted and discussed uh, within the full preterist community that demonstrate Gary's problems of inconsistency and maybe unfortunately a willing a, a unwillingness to grow uh, and catch up with where the conversation in theology and sociology if you will uh, have gone uh, in these regards so let's talk first about the what now podcast that he did and I'm going to provide some quotes from him as I double backed and did the legwork, if you will, of just get kind of transcribing his words uh, that I think need to be highlighted from that podcast. But again, I encourage you, listen to the podcast yourself and take your own notes. So he said this, I was asked to come to deal with a particular issue that those of the boroughs of Berea and many others were stating about full preterists. Some full preterists were saying everything stopped in AD 70. The gospel had gone out into the world, AD 70 was the end of everything, and the question was coming down to, now what? What do us Christians do? So, a couple things here. Uh, you, you know, what he's speaking about is the his engagement of speaking at the Berean Bible Church conference, and uh, his two lectures that he had given there, and I think also his podcast recordings with the boroughs of Berea, which again, some of them are professed full preterists, if you will. So um, now let's continue into why he says he was there. He says that he was invited because there's full preterists that are saying everything stopped in AD 70 uh, and that, um, you know, that it came down to what should we do now. So let's deal with the first part there, uh, that he was invited because there's some full preterists that are teaching everything stopped in AD 70. But Gary doesn't identify as a full preterist. So why would Gary be invited to clarify what full preterists believe regarding what now? Uh, that's just a very perplexing thing for me. Uh, I think what folks were hoping for from him was continued growth, seeking, searching, studying, and proving, uh, a willingness to admit that, you know, in years past, he might not have given as much weight and honesty to the power of preterism, if you will. Uh, you know, that's what I imagine folks were anticipating from the him at the uh, the Berean Bible Church conference. Reason being, uh, you know, were they asking him what should Christians do now after AD 70? You know, I know Gary's a worldview guy. However, Berean Bible Church has been hosting these conferences for years, asking the question, what next? What now? If you will, we here at the Blue Point Bible Church hosted a conference about what next. And, you know, I don't know that Gary would be the guy that folks would reach out to 
to uh, talk about that and, and, and ask that question. So I, I just disagree. I think that that's uh, you know, not true. I think folks were looking for growth from him and progress uh, in regards to his understanding. And uh, I do want to acknowledge, thanks, Chris, for tuning in. Uh, Gary has been around the full preterism long enough. I think he really knows the answers to the questions he's asked uh, or asking about full preterism. Uh, absolutely, I agree. And uh, yeah, Dallas, it's late night. You know, appreciate you, brother, and, and your efforts. And um, yeah, so uh, I really do. I think that you know, it just doesn't work with me. I think people were expecting far more from Gary than what he thinks. Uh, we, we weren't simply asking him, well, Gary, what do we do as full preterists now that some full preterists believe uh, everything stopped in AD 70? What do you say we should do? I don't know. You know, it just doesn't seem like the right person. Uh, you know, to ask that question, uh, audience relevance, if you will. So uh, then he goes on to talk a bit about this accomplished and applied understanding. And many of us who tuned into his effort with Kim Burgess uh, remember that being talked about uh, in that hermeneutic that they were offering up, that everything's been accomplished and needs to be applied. And, uh, you, you know, uh, I think that's, yeah, I, I get it. Um, they uh, talked about preterism as being something that's not something that ends in the uh, you know in the first century, but rather began something that goes past the first century. And I would agree. Uh, there was a blog he recently put out regarding the term preterism. I posted about it on my Facebook page here, and um, yeah. So uh, you know, again, I would agree. I think that he made some good points regarding what preterism is saying about accomplished and applied. I think we've noticed that the partial preterists, if you will, are, are rather inconsistent. I know Kim Burgess had come up with this idea of consistent preterism. I think many of us lamented that uh, the consistent preterism reeks of partial preterism, inconsistent, uh, doesn't apply the right uh, way that it should, uh, you, you know, and seems to make things uh, more perplexing as I listen to that podcast, at least uh, Covenant Hermeneutics and Kingdom uh kingdom eschatology, if you were something to that effect. So uh, Gary goes on to talk about in this most recent podcast uh, that all of the promises made to Israel had to be fulfilled. And, and that's true. Uh, what we would, of course, ask to be brought up in that discussion would be what about the resurrection of the dead? What about the judgment? What about Isaiah chapters 24 through 28, which uh, many, and I've done debates on this topic, many Futurists, partial preterists say still needs to be fulfilled. Uh, that's a text that they're cleaving to regarding the resurrection of the dead. Uh, well, uh, that's problematic because Isaiah 24 through 28 is a promise to Israel. Uh, that's definitely, um, you, you know, uh, important uh, to be uh, considered that, you know, the promises made to Israel had to be fulfilled. Yes, amen. Matthew 5, 17 through 18, we read about the jots and tittles that were given to Israel and, uh, you know, the importance of understanding that. Um, to claim it is Israel only is preposterous, and I would agree. Amen. That, that's, you know, that that's, um, we're, we're not talking about Israel only. That's, we're talking about full preterism uh, and, and what we should believe. Why do we need to go into this aberrant idea of Israel only constantly? Uh, or what they've liked to refer to as full stop preterism, which again, I don't know that that lends to clarity because I think people think that they're talking about full preterism uh, rather than Israel only, which again, is already designated Israel only. That's what those folks believe. And let them believe that and promote that and join every Facebook group and uh, talk about that. That's fine. But we don't need to make every conversation go in that direction. I don't know that folks are asking Gary about that, especially when we're talking about the Christian worldview as full preterists. We don't need to talk about Israel only. It's been proven by full preterists to be aberrant and wrong. So, um, you know, and, and Gary kind of posits this idea that a lot of full preterists say it's all been fulfilled and we're kind of left on our own now. Uh, I don't know too many full preterists that believe that. I think that, uh, you know, are we left in regards to our conscience, which I'll get in on here in a moment? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think we need to acknowledge that there are different kinds of full preterists. You know, there's Church of Christ. There's all these denominations that exist within the wider world of Christianity. Um, you know, so, of course, as they come into the knowledge of full preterism, uh, we see the differences within full preterism. So that's, you know, again, I think that's across the board uh, within Christianity. Um, and I think each of those groups have responses to what we should be doing now uh, that would say we're not left to our own 
own devices. I believe we're left to a renewed mind uh, that should be demonstrated through the Christian church, through the community of God, uh, the people of God, if you will, the individuals that call themselves Christians. Uh, and it should be by a renewed mind, uh, again, an effort of, e or an ethos, if you will, of seeking, searching, studying, and proving. So um, I, I just think that's really important to consider. Uh, I don't know that Gary's the person that folks need to hear talk about what now. Uh, we need Gary to help us understand um, why many futurists like himself have kind of went against the idea and consistency of full preterism and still kind of go against it. So that's kind of where I think people are at. Uh, I'll double back to my, my chat here. Uh, Spiro asked me if I would cons consider Greek Orthodox to be Christian. Absolutely. Uh, the, you know, I'm going to lean in on that actually at the end of this program, Spiro. So I appreciate you asking me that question. Um, I don't make pro Bible prophecy the end all of our fellowship in what we call Christian or not Christian. Uh, I'll lean in on that topic again at the end. Uh, I think we need to be careful what we what we uh, try to hereticize and call not Christian. Uh, so yes, you know, you know, long story short, Spiro, absolutely. Uh, I believe there's Christians of all different ilks, Catholic, Orthodox, uh, Baptist, uh, Pentecostal, uh, Bapticostal, you know, all the different ilks that are out there. So uh, I definitely appreciate that. And I encourage you to stay tuned in as I lean in on the conclusion tonight talking a little bit about the idea of heresy and hereticizing people and saying that they're not believers or not Christians in that regard, maybe because of some differences in our, or big differences uh, in our understanding. So again, stay tuned in and I'll kind of lean in on that point here in a moment. So Gary goes on to say this in that podcast, I have not laid out a maximal approach to eschatology. I'm still trying to deal with all the particulars. That's a great and humbling thing to say. He's admitting we haven't come up with a maximal eschatology. The full preterist community for years has said things like there's never been a, um, an, a council or a, you know, an ecumenical idea of bringing together of minds regarding eschatology and what we're saying we should or should not believe. So it's wrong for people to hereticize preterist, full preterist. And again, I've seen this firsthand. I've been to meetings with hosts of pastors that disagree in eschatology. However, once they hear the idea of full preterism, where it actually lends to clarity, uh, you know, I'm wrong. <laughs> Meanwhile, I listen to 35 to 65 men uh, go around and say nothing but utter confusion. So, uh, you know, again, I've been there firsthand. I've seen this happen. I've talked with people about their eschatology and watched them kind of not know what to say and then only to uh, later hereticize, you know, full preterism. So uh, I've just seen this again and again. And again, that's all a part of this this point of Pretergate, where we're just seeing continued uh, obstinance against clarity, consistency, and a willingness to be a people of uh, semper reformanda, clestia est, if you will, uh, that we would always be reforming and, and allowing the church to be constantly reformed to interact with the truths that we've come to see as true uh, and admit where we were wrong. So um, doubling back to some of the things Gary led in on in that podcast, uh, he said uh, he talked about covenant creation a little bit beyond creation science and uh, not so much in a favorable way. Uh, he said that uh, he deals with uh, this quite a bit in whatever book. He's always mentioning a book that he wrote, you know, and I appreciate that. I've written books. So I, I tell people, you know, I, well, I've dealt with that in my book and so forth and um, usually that's so I could help explain it, not so much that I could shut down the conversation. And then he brought up uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 35. And he said that this individual regarding covenant creation, let's kind of blow up his spot this evening. That's uh, Tim Martin. Uh, Tim Martin interacting with uh, Gary DeMar here. And um, he says that Tim brings up Matthew chapter 23. Come on now. Let's let's open up our scriptures here and, and lean in on this a bit. So Matthew chapter 23 verse 35. Now let's double back to verse 34 because it's a kind of fills in the whole sentence. And this is Jesus again, speaking to the Pharisees, speaking to the religious leaders there in Jerusalem in the first century. And he says this, therefore, behold, again, verse 34, Matthew 23, verse 34. Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Who's the you? The first century leaders, Jewish leaders there in Jerusalem. Wise men, prophets, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel 
to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So Tim, and again, the book Beyond Creation Science leads in on this a bit and talks about how the blood of going all the way back to Abel, not the blood of the Mosaic Covenant, not the blood of that first century generation, not the blood that had been shed during the 500 years of confusion and silence by many, uh, many standard. Um, no, the blood going back to Abel, the beginning of the covenant, Genesis chapters 2 through 3. And that was all coming upon that generation. So we have no, we cannot separate this atomic idea that, you know, Gary and Kim had postured uh, in their podcast uh, and then kind of lean in on an Israel idea uh, and then have Jesus coming for Israel first and then later for the full atomic people. No, no, it's all connected. And again, you know, Tim Martin does a great job in the book, uh, Tim and Jeff, you know, Jeff Vaughn, uh, Beyond Creation Science, again, Visit beyondcreationscience.com. Go to Google, look up, or YouTube, if you will, and look up Covenant Creation, Tim Martin, and find them uh, there. So, uh, interestingly enough, Gary says this in response to Tim's quandary, if you will, uh, regarding what we read here about the blood of Abel and how this, you know, doesn't allow for this idea that, you know, there there's a distinction between the Mosaic Covenant and the Adamic Covenant, if you will. Uh, so, then uh, this is how Gary responds. No one is asking that question like you're wanting that question to be asked. What? Yes, we are. Plenty of us are. Uh, you know, we're posturing and, and helping folks understand that there is no idea of atomic eschatology or, uh, you know, and then Israel's eschatology and a return back to, uh, again, the confusion that Kim, unfortunately, and, Je and uh, Gary had highlighted in that podcast they did. So, uh, you know, again, I want to encourage you, uh, go back, listen to their podcast and see the problem with this idea they were posturing and how that relates to what Tim Martin's bringing up regarding not only, but, you know, th let's just highlight this, Matthew chapter 23, verses 34 through 35, and how it brings it back to Abel, not to Moses, Abel. So, uh, you know, eschatology that was happening in the first century, Israel's eschatology, if you will, is attached to Adam. And that's important and moves us past this partial preterist idea. So then the conversation got interesting. And this is where I realized there's some really big confusion. And interestingly enough, as I'll mention here in a moment, uh, we're going through the book of Romans here at Blue Point. So uh, this conversation was very relevant to some of the things I've been preaching about and talking about. And before I get in on that, I'll just double back to our chat here. Um, Paul Richard Strange Sr., God bless you, brother. I look forward to reading your book, uh, Love God and Leave the Last Days Behind. What a title. Uh, I look forward to leaning in on your book here in the near future and writing up a review. So thank you for being tuned in this evening. And he had said, uh, for many Christians who are friendly toward past fulfilled prophecy, but not there, isn't likely that... Sorry, my screen uh, went down here. Uh, isn't likely... That questions about the things commanded for Christians is a huge issue. They suspect often that we want to discourage local church connections in some cases. We can full preterists, Christians who are not all creating purely individual ex expressions of the faith. Thanks for your wonderful labor of love. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Paul. Uh, I definitely ap appreciate that. And I agree. You know, I think we see a very uh, similar individualistic idea of Christianity uh, that it's been there for you know generations now uh, where many want to kind of say I can I can just do this at home by myself I can have my own relationship with God uh, we unfortunately see this in the, in the same the preterist community as well so uh, I think that you know folks need to think about that so um, Spiro began to ask me about the text the text I was highlighting was Matthew chapter 23 uh, verses 34 through 35. I see that uh, Greg had mentioned there, Matthew 24, 34 through 35. Again, another very important text. However, for the sake of this conversation regarding covenant creation and beyond creation science that Gary had mentioned in that podcast, uh, we're talking about Matthew chapter 23, verses 34 through 35, and particularly the blood of Abel uh, that was going to be uh, poured out upon that generation, that that generation would be held accountable for, uh, which, you know, highlights that the Adamic 
eschatology, if you want to call it that, is uh, attached to Israel's eschatology that we saw in the first century. So just some important things to consider that Gary had highlighted in that podcast. So I just want to double check that my camera is still in the right place. And I'm very appreciative that uh, folks are tuned in here and uh, you know, and uh, definitely, hopefully, you're sharing this, and uh, let's you know really bring out this idea of Predergate. Uh, thank you, Greg, for you know leaning in on the conversation. You highlighted an important text, nonetheless. So thank you for uh, you know bringing that up, and I'm glad that we're here commenting and folks are encouraging me. I don't get that same encouragement necessarily through Zoom. Uh, Zoom is more face to face, and uh, I do want to encourage folks. I do Zoom sessions often. If you want to join in. Uh, we do make that available to everyone. So thank you for commenting tonight. This is a, a neat experience for me, uh, and it's encouraging. So thank you. Uh, please share this video more and more. Uh, let's get the word out regarding preterism, power of preterism, uh, the Pretergate idea that's happening within Christianity and how folks are interacting with preterism. Uh, it's unfortunate that we have to have a scandal, if you will, uh, to get attention, but I, I think that we're seeing it nonetheless. So uh, Gary goes in on this, and this is kind of where we're going to get into some of the meat and potatoes of what I wanted to talk to you about tonight. And I promised I already ate dinner, so it's not that I'm hungry that I keep saying meat and potatoes. Um, Gary says this, if it's your position that we no longer appeal to the Bible, including the Old Testament, in some of these things, I'm not calling you a heretic, I just think you're wrong. Okay, so... I understand the no longer appealing to the Bible. It was years ago, I remember Pastor Dave Curtis at Berean Bible Church did a video talking about the Israel-only heresy, which didn't fully have that name yet and wasn't being promoted as much as it is now. Uh, however, he had done a video against uh, that idea with uh, the name, Don't Let Them Take Away Your Bible. And, you know, again, that idea that none of it applies to you. None of it has any relevance for you today. It's all made up. We're wannabe Israelites. I believe somebody called me that on social media at some point. Um, you know, that's this Israel-only idea. Uh, so, uh, sure, Israel-only would say you don't appeal to the Bible. Uh, most preterists I know, we tend to be Bible-based Christians. We study our Bible. We talk about the Bible. We wrangle uh, with others about the Bible, if you will. So, um, you know, I definitely... Uh, uh, you know, I don't agree that there's a lot of preterists that say we don't appeal to the Bible. Now, let's consider the second part of what Gary says. He says, including the Old Testament in some of these things. Well, you know, curious minds want to know, uh, you know, the Old Testament in some of these things. What does that mean? What's some of these things? Uh, is that the things that we're not comfortable with? Or, you, you know, is that some sort of call that we, uh, you know, we need to remember that we shouldn't be shaving our beards. Uh, you know, what's going on here? I don't know. Uh, and uh, that we shouldn't have tattoos. Uh, you know, I've heard that one a lot, piercings and so forth. Um, you know, what, what Old Testament text do we pick and choose that we were going to apply? Uh, and it seems as though, um, you know, Gary says, I'm not calling you a heretic. I just think you're wrong. So in this, you know, I have to say, it sounds like Gary's really leaning in on some sort of uh, political ideas and it becomes very not only political ideas but old testament uh the way the old testament interacts with the new covenant uh, and what the how the law interacts with what we're saying as the new covenant church the gentiles coming in on the faith do they come in under the the law of moses do we still have that battle today uh you know and what full preterism is actually saying regarding the old covenant law uh you know and i think it's good that gary's bringing this up because i think this conversation also needs to be had within the full preterist community but I don't know that Gary's the best one to uh, clarify what full preterists believe in this regard because he seems rather confused, which I think will be apparent as I lean in on this a little bit more this evening. So uh, if you're still tuned in, you know, I very much appreciate you being tuned in this evening. Um, thank you, uh, Greg, for some more questions here. Do you know what year he made that video and what is his name? Uh, if you're asking about Pastor Dave Curtis, uh, the pastor of Berean Bible Church, uh, the video would be called, uh, that I mentioned before, I think was, um, don't let them take away your Bible. Uh, you know, I could go ahead and dig it up. I'll share it on my social media later this evening as a sort of flashback or earlier today. Geesh, uh, it's already mid past midnight here uh, in Bluepoint, but I'll share it on my social media and make it available. Maybe even here in the comments uh, after I post this video live. So um, again, you might be able to go to YouTube and just put in Dave Curtis, uh, then um don't let them take away your bible so 
uh, or don't let them steal your Bible, something to some title to that effect. But again, look for my post. I'll share about it later. Thank you, brother. Um, so again, I, I don't know that Gary's leaning in on something that the full preterist community has not dealt with already. Uh, and, you know, we've marked out that that's not full preterism. So, um, however, now Gary gets in on the law or what he calls God's law. Uh, and then he said, quote, I'm sure that these guys, talking about full preterists, are not saying that the Bible is set aside. But a lot of them, one of them, is kind of, and I, I just quoted it there, and then I picked up with another part of his uh, what he had said there. He said, I didn't care for his approach. Uh, and then he went on to say that uh, sometimes the, the, the opposition created to our ideas is not necessarily our ideas, but the approach that we take. And, and, you know, I can agree with that. However, in this regard, who he was speaking about is Ward Fenley. And I would disagree. Uh, I would encourage you to visit NCMI Live and understand the distinction uh, that, you know, the difference that is there between what Gary's positing and what Ward Fenley's positing regarding the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was to magnify sin, to demonstrate unrighteousness, self-righteousness, the problem with these ideas. And, and that has been done away with. So uh, we are not to be using God's law in these aberrant ways that Gary, unfortunately, is positing. And I'm going to share more from him here in a moment. But I did want to highlight, that's who he was talking about, the man from California that he disagrees with. It's Ward Fenley. And, you know, I would encourage you to visit NCMI Live and see for yourself. Uh, or even listen to some of the more recent lectures he's given here at our various conferences at the Blue Point Bible Church. And, and take note of the difference between uh, progressive sanctification, if you will, uh, or theonomy, uh, and what uh, Ward is saying in regards to the Old Covenant and Old Testament law. So um, Gary goes on to say that he's not going to apologize for his views. You know, I guess he's dug his heels in here. Uh, you know, it, it sounds uh, unfortunate because uh, we are called to apologize, if you will. Uh, that's apologetics. That's what Gary's doing uh, in regards to worldview. So he does need to apologize for his views of the law. He does need to interact and have responses and, and answer questions uh, in regards to these things if he's going to posit this. And of course, he jumped right in on the topic of homosexuality, uh, you know, and then uh, went on to mock those that believe the Old Testament doesn't apply anymore. You know, he says, okay, so now what? Uh, is uh, that something in talking about some more recent events that happened in the White uh, or in the, the Senate on the Senate floor? Uh, you know, and, and you know, always some strange ideas get brought up by folks that want to run back to these conversations. Um, you know, and he said, is that something that should be condemned? Uh, and then he talks about the problem being uh, the application of God's law. And then Eric, who he does the program with, brought up the uh, the judges that were needed to apply the law, which I thought was a great concept and actually something I'm going to be highlighting in my upcoming book, uh, the Kingdom Kings book that I've been promising for years, uh, where I'm going to demonstrate an outworking of a full preterist hermeneutic in our lives and how we are all called, men and women, called to live as Kingdom Kings. Uh, and uh, I think that we need to be considering that a bit more. Uh, and, and applying that should answer our question, how we would apply... God's law, how we would apply the Old Testament, the New Testament, uh, and ultimately the things that we believe and do with our lives. So the second podcast was Gary getting in on this concept a little bit more. God's law, uh, how we apply the Old Testament with the New Testament. And I'm great, uh, grateful to see that this is pushing the conversation to progress a bit further because ultimately what we believe about fulfilled Bible prophecy will relate to the way that we believe the law interacts with the New Covenant. And I think Dr. Don K. Preston has done some great work uh, regarding Torah to tell us to kind of lay the foundation for us to understand the Torah being uh, the incomplete, the, that which was fading away, the law being that which was fading away, uh, the magnifying of sin, if you will, um, because all that we would see that was revealed through the law was self-righteousness and unrighteousness, uh, whereas now highlighting the new covenant and, and allowing for distinctions and differences and renewed consciences, renewed minds, if you will, um, how that lends to a better New Covenant hermeneutic and New Covenant understanding, which again, Gary seems to not understand. So now let's consider that other podcast I mentioned uh, where he talks about God's law. And uh, he says, the debate regarding God's law has been going on since the 70s. So uh, I think that's a great point uh, because I agree that the, this debate has been going on forever, for that matter. You know, you go back to the early centuries of the early, you know, the early church, if you will, 
first couple centuries uh, of the Christian church. And what you see there is um, a lot of confusion regarding how the law interacted with the community. So again, that's been there from the very beginning. My question would be why we're not progressing, why we see these constant issues just kind of being brought up. I think it's a influx of uh, politics, conservatism, if you will, and um, especially here in the West, and, um, and then a misunderstanding regarding how these covenants, these laws, if you will, interact with one another. Uh, and Gary goes on to talk about, you know, the, the debate is namely over the application of God's law to every area of life. Uh, you know, and I would say, amen, uh, what law? What law are we going by? And he kind of mocks my understanding. So I'll share some of that with you as I go in on uh, what he had shared here on this second podcast, which I do want to encourage you. Go ahead and listen for yourself. Get frustrated with me so that we can ask Gary to be a bit more accountable to the things that he's saying regarding full preterism uh, in the very least. Uh, Dallas had mentioned here, there's nothing wrong with learning the principles of the law. The danger is when humans make using the law to get to God. Yeah, and amen, that's exactly it. You, you know, and it becomes this, uh, uh, you, you know, I do think there's an application. I think there's an application. I had just said to someone last night, let me just mention this here uh, briefly to kind of respond to that point. Just last night, I talked to a friend who, uh, a brother in the faith who, you know, I guess would identify himself as a futurist. And uh, we got to talking about Second Thessalonians chapter 1, uh, where we talk about the afflicted, those that are afflicting you uh, will be afflicted. And uh, those of us that are full preterists know that that's speaking about AD 70. And, you know, those uh, that were persecuting the Gentiles there, namely in the Thessalonican church, were the Judaizers and uh, how they would come under judgment and it would be seen by all men. Uh, and it, it was. Amen. Praise God. Now, um, I said that, you know, I think it's wrong for full preterists to constantly rip these verses out of people's hands and, and leave them with any appli without application. Uh, that, you know, that, that w so why was Paul saying that? Where, where did that come from? Does it only apply to the Thessalonian church or is that an eternal truth? Which again is a point I want to uh, lean in on and end with here later this evening because I think these are areas of progress for the full preterist community. Uh, but again, I'm hoping right on, what I'm marking out right now is uh, the interaction of the law and the gospel uh, and the idea that many have to create sort of this idea of theonomy uh, you know to impose the old covenant law on many uh, without consistency uh, you know if you want to go ahead and uh, aim for consistency i think a great book to get your hands on would be uh, the year of living living biblically i'm forgetting the name of the author uh, it'll make for a good read and a great laugh uh, in the very least. And then also uh, the year of living like Jesus, which again was uh, Dobson, I believe, uh, was the name of the pastor there that went ahead and created this effort. And both of them are rather humorous and, and they lean in on some great education regarding the law and the problems we would have with kind of imposing that uh, on a new covenant understanding. So uh, two great books that I would encourage you to check out. And uh, and maybe even, you know, let me say this regarding the, uh, the year of living like Jesus. Uh, Dobson, um, I'm forgetting his first name, please excuse me. Uh, however, uh, he goes, I imagine he's not a full preterist, so he wouldn't understand the interaction with the law and the new covenant that I would uh, demonstrate. However, he, uh, he, he challenges you to get an understanding of the law, uh, to you know really see some of the things Jesus would have been understanding and, and demonstrating, and maybe some more, more recent contemporary ideas that are built upon these ancient Jewish traditions so uh, that are found within Christendom. So uh, a great book, good read. Uh, you know, I might even, now that I'm mentioning it, double back to that. And uh, I think that they, it, it lends to clarity regarding uh, the confusion that many have regarding the application of God's law. And that's what Gary claims to be chasing after here. He goes on to say this, what does that mean that we are no longer under the law? Does that mean that there is no law for us to obey? No, no, it's not that. That's not the case. So what law is it? Well, it's the New Testament, only law. Only what's in the New Testament. So only what's repeated in the New Testament is what we are supposed to follow. And he ends the quote there. Uh, and then he goes on to you know, kind of talk about red letter Christians and say it's only the words of Jesus. And uh, then he highlighted, you know, if I may just highlight this here and read the verse to us. He highlighted Mark chapter 7, verse 5. And here it reads, uh, And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the traditions of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? 
And then Jesus went on to uh, cite the law. And, and basically, again, you know, he talks about this in the Gospel of Matthew where he says, um, you know, you need to have a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. Uh, you know, again, here he's highlighting that there's people that have these outward things. He wasn't necessarily saying there was anything wrong. Jesus was born under law. And we read that in Galatians 4.4. 4. So he wasn't saying there was anything wrong with the law in, in that aspect. However, um, highlighting that those that were living in this identity of under law were hypocrites and were decorating the outside but not paying attention to the, the more uh, weightier things of the law to quote Jesus. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of problems in that time. And that's what's going on here in, in Matthew chapter, uh, Mark chapter 7, if you will. Um, Gary seems to have a, a misunderstanding. So then he goes on to say, so those who go against the Reconstructionists, though, uh, the Theonomy and, and so forth, they are out of touch with biblical reality. I'm not saying that I know how every one of the laws are applied. That's not my business. Well, you're talking about this, so you're making your business, Gary. And, uh, you, you know, that if this has to do with Bible prophecy and what full preterists are saying, and your idea of why you're not calling yourself a full preterist is because of the confusion regarding this law, then sure, it is your business, Gary. Uh, this is actually Predergate. This is where we're seeing uh, the inconsistency of some, the insistence on not being consistent, uh, you, you know, from many uh, that needs to be marked out and highlighted. So, uh, yes, it is your business, Gary. Glad that you, uh, you've you been talking about this. And I appreciate that you've been talking about this. So, uh, he talks, he's talking again there about men like Ward Fenley. So, uh, if you want to understand what he's getting going against, uh, those that go against Reconstructionists or Theonomy, uh, I would be one of those people as well. Uh, he's talking about myself, Ward Fenley. Uh, you, you know, I think I could include Tim Martin and many others uh, in that idea. Don Preston's book, Torah to Tell Us, demonstrates the fulfillment of every jot and tittle of the Old Covenant law and why it needed to be fulfilled, because it magnified sin. It demonstrated the problem that was being overcome through Jesus Christ, that we've moved past the curse. Gary goes on to say, you see, there's always an attempt to apply aspects of the Old Testament law in the New Testament. Uh, there's none of this, that's all done away with. Well, that's also because most of the New Testament, or all of the New Testament for that matter, was written prior to AD 70, uh, where now after AD 70, even the Jewish community themselves will admit that we're dealing with rabbinical Judaism. So uh, we're not even dealing with New Covenant Judaism, or I'm sorry, the uh, first century Judaism, uh, because uh, of the temple being destroyed. So you know, the Jewish community would lead in on that conversation as well. So uh, Gary just needs to catch up in that, that regard. So, um, yeah, in the New Testament, there surely was an application. And they brought up uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which, again, I think understanding the larger context, more recently I taught through uh, both of the Corinthian letters, where you saw a lot of divides between Jew and Gentile. Uh, you know, and what's going on there in the congregations. Just doubling back to, I would say, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, where Paul talks about, you know, Apollos, the Hellenized understanding uh, that was coming from Alexandria, if you will, uh, and uh, being baptized by Paul, and then he mentions Peter. And again, we saw Paul and Peter had some distinctions in their understanding. So, uh, you know, that was something very first century, very applicational to what was going on there in Corinth. Uh, and that's why they cited certain Old Testament laws, uh, which again, it was all prior to first century, uh, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. So uh, it doesn't really help us understand uh, what we're supposed to do with the law after AD 70. Uh, so uh, then he goes on to say, I, when I hear people say that the law has been done away with, okay, so what about incest? What about sex with animals? Uh, how do you define fornication? And it always goes to this. It always goes to these crazy extremes. Uh, rather than, you know, what would you say about shaving your beard? Uh, what would you say about, um, you know, head coverings, which again, a lot of traditions within Christianity uh, think are important. Um, you, you know, why don't we bring up those rather than running into these strange perversions and, and things that um, the majority of our society kind of doesn't think about anyway. So, uh, you know, and again, I know that, that now we're getting in on politics, which again, I think relates a lot to the way Gary frames conversations and it frustrates me to no end, if I may be transparent. So continuing here, he says, uh, Paul calls out those in Corinth using the Old Testament law. Amen. Um, then he goes on to talk about Muslim extremists, uh, which I, I found frustrating here. Um, he says, uh, oh, but Christian nationalism is the problem. And he's being facetious uh, there. Uh, you, you know, we could say Muslim extremists are a problem. 
Uh, and then we could also say Christian nationalists are a problem. We don't need to make it. It needs to be this and or uh, idea here. Wrong is wrong. Uh, Hamas is wrong. Israel is wrong. Uh, you, you know, <laughs> we don't need to say, well, it has to be one or the other. So just again, false positing, unfortunately, here by Gary. And uh, we should expect more from him uh, and encourage more from him. So that's why I'm bringing these things up. I think it really does lean in on what we're seeing in the larger Christian community regarding the uh, the power of preterism, regarding Pretergate, to kind of highlight that phrase. Um, can't say it without laughing. Uh, but again, it's sad. It's, it's, you know, I say it, laughing is almost like my protection against being ultimately very frustrated by the lack of consistency, the unwillingness to grow and be consistent that we see within the larger Christian community. Uh, I see this online by these, these great teachers, these giants, if you will. And then I see it locally here, even in our local assemblies or even amongst other Christians that I interact with and fellowship with. And I know many others uh, that I network with that have uh, that idea. So, uh, you know, that have these frustrations. So that's why I bring this up. Um, Spiro asked if we can read something from John. Uh, Spiro, if you share it in the chat there and I find it applicable, I'll surely uh, share it. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, Paul Richard Strange Sr. jumped in here and I very much appreciate your work to challenge Brother DeMar and point out his efforts that helped stimulate many Christians to think about fulfillment, even though we don't see his views as yet consistent. Amen. Uh, and, and stopping at partial preterism. Yeah, it's, it is unfortunate. Uh, on a personal note, he wrote a very kind note to me when I first began to grasp past fulfillment in the mid 80s. And that's beautiful. You know, again, Gary's done so much. We need to make sure we're appreciating that. I try to do my best in making sure he knows that he's appreciated all the while poking uh, at him a bit and wanting him to be uh, to just lead to a greater consistency because many of us, you know, uh, you know, we look to him, we, we desire his teachings, we appreciate the things, the way he says certain things, and, uh, you know, I'm included in that. So, uh, yeah, amen, brother, and I, I will keep uh, kind of talking to Gary, pointing out things, uh, listening to his teachings. Uh, what do they say? Criticism is the greatest form of flattery or something, imitation, I think it is. But either way, um, you know, I would say I'm imitating Gary and wanting to highlight these things and talk about these things. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very much encouraged by him, and I hope uh, that this doesn't come off as attacking, but comes off as a desire for a greater consistency, not only from Gary, but in the larger Christian community. Uh, many folks learn from him and look to him, and uh, they even had welcomed him here on Long Island years ago, uh, and that congregation has just kind of dug their heels in on some inconsistent ideas. So I'm hoping that highlighting this might expose many others to greater clarity. So um, I wrote here in my notes that both the problem uh, Gary doesn't want to agree with that idea. He wants to highlight one uh, greater than the other and then doubles back to this idea of what standard, by what standard. And I'll tell you, I watched a horrendous view of uh, a video put together years ago by the, uh, the, the founders organization called By What Standard. And, and they demonstrated in that video, in my opinion, the problem with trying to bring old covenant law into new covenant principles. I had people walk out of a study that I hosted by just filming that video. So, uh, you know, again, uh, it's sad and it's unfortunate when we try to do this. Uh, then Gary goes on to dividing up the law, ceremonial, moral, and talks about Greg Bonson and a lot of these other teachers that did this, which, you know, for me, I was taught that that's dispensationalism. That was some of my early discussions as I talked about preterist truth with uh, teachers would be, well, no, we don't divide. We don't have the privilege to divide up the law. Jesus didn't teach that, uh, dividing up the law, you know, ceremonial and uh, moral, etc. It's just an erroneous way to understand things. Um, Gary goes on to admit, uh, is it easy to figure out these laws apply today? No, it's not easy. Uh, so uh, how do we determine what's good and evil is his kind of a way of posturing that we need to look to the old covenant law. I, I don't necessarily think that to be the case. Uh, then he said this, and this this is really what it, it where a lot of his confusion comes in. Why would you pass up some of these laws in the Old Testament? Some apply, some don't apply. To be left with democracy. 51%, the professors, the universities. Look at what we have today. Redefinition of what a man or a woman is. Dot, dot, dot. And obviously he goes on and rambles more and more. So it's all political. It lends to just political confusion. And I've seen this. This is unfortunately in the preterist community as well. Uh, folks don't seem to really know how to allow these things to interact with one another. And, um, you know, I'm actually teaching through, uh, we're doing a reading through Roman sermon series. We started at Romans chapter one. We actually started 
uh, all the way back in Matthew. We went to Mark. We went to Thessalonians. We went to Corinth. Uh, now we're dealing with the Romans letter, and we're just journeying chronologically as these letters were written to the churches in the first century. And uh, this past week, I highlighted being set free from the law, and I did a full study. I actually plugged in, you know, the law. Um, you know, and, and where it's talked about in the Thessalonian letters, where it's talked about in the Corinthian letters, where it's talked about in the Roman letters. And I put together a little outline for you to do your own study and for you to see yourself what the New Testament has to say about the doing away of the law uh, and how it's an erroneous standard to place upon people uh, in any fashion today. Theonomy is wrong. This Reconstructionist idea is wrong. And uh, Ward Fenley actually would be somebody, rather than Gary speaking, you know, against him, Ward Fenley would be somebody you'd fare well to uh, learn about the interaction of the New Covenant uh, and the, uh, you know, Old Covenant uh, from. So Ward Fenley, NCMI Live, definitely go ahead and tune in there. And, um, uh, of course, I want to encourage you to check out my blog, mianogonewild.wordpress.com. That's where I've been posting some of our uh, reading through Roman sermon notes and details. So check that out and do the study. You know, go ahead, lean in on it and see for yourself uh, the way that the New Covenant posits it. And yes, does it create questions? Absolutely. But we need a, a greater consistency uh, within uh, what we're saying, especially about what we're saying about the Old Covenant law. Uh, so once we get over that hurdle, then we can begin to talk about, well, then what do we do now? What are we teaching people to do? And many of you know I've led in on that a bit uh, regarding, um, let's say, uh, the conscience and, and what we're uh, encouraging as Christians. You know, not national law, not American law, if you will, uh, world law, but rather what we are encouraging in our churches uh, as Christians and, and what we hope to see. So uh, I encourage you to stay tuned to that discussion. Uh, and hopefully tonight I've given you some things to think about, some things to lean in on. Now, in conclusion, uh, if you're reading through the book of Romans, the apostle actually says, uh, do you know the law? It's Romans 7.1. I'm speaking to know those who know the law. And uh, what we have to be honest with, if we're going to read through the book of Romans, we're going to cite the book of Romans. You know, maybe you love Romans chapter 12. A lot of people bring up that text. I know early on in my Christian walk, I brought up that text. Well, you have to acknowledge that in Romans 7, Paul says, I'm speaking to those who know the law. So much of the things in the letter, especially chapters 1 through, let's say, 8, uh, are definitely, or not even, you know, I would have to include 1 through 15, uh, which again, is just the entire book. Uh, so um, we have to consider the, the whole book and, and how it interacts with one another uh, and see how the, uh, the law and the gospel, if you will, interact with one another. Uh, you know, we have to ask questions. I posted this on fo uh, social media more recently. How could Joshua and David meditate upon the law and live by the law? Uh, but the Apostle Paul says those in Jesus Christ have died to the law. Uh, you know, we need to see this, be honest with this debate, and we need to see some of the confusion that's been postured uh, in this conversation. So um, I see some more comments. So I just wanted to double check on what's going on here in my chat. Um, Dallas had brought up there's nothing wrong with Learning the principles of the law, the dangers when humans uh, make using the law to get to God. Oh, I think that was an earlier statement. Yeah, amen. Uh, thank you, Dallas. And I totally agree. So um, I think we need to uh, be thinking about that and paying attention to that. So uh, and being wary of those that would impose Old Testament law as morality today. Um, you know, I think there's different ways that we need to interact with that. And I'll actually get in on that here as we close out. So in conclusion, I'm hoping that I've challenged you that you need to think about this. You need to see how important the interaction of the law and the gospel are with one another. Uh, then I wanted to highlight this because this was a question that was posited to me uh, regarding preterism. And I think there's a lot of confusion regarding what preterists believe for the future. That seems to be a big thing. Uh, you know, I could spend all day talking to someone about time statements and audience relevance and have them agree with me. And then the next question they're going to ask me is, well, then what is that saying about the future? So I just wanted to dem uh, share a little bit of a quote that I, I posted to a, a friend messaging me about this, a sister in Christ, if you will. Uh, full preterists believe all that was necessary, all that was needed to be done to secure our after this life reality has already been accomplished. There is more increase to his kingdom, increase to our reality, and increase in our knowledge of him. So, no, I don't believe AD 70 everything was done. I believe that in AD 70, everything that was needed for the presence of God to be demonstrated in the lives of believers here on earth, and yes, in our after this life experience, 
has been accomplished. I love uh, Roman, uh, Revelation chapter 14. talks about blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. After what? After the destruction of Babylon, which was the city of Jerusalem. After that event, uh, it, it did away with the Hadean idea and realm, if you will. And uh, saints could go from directly from this life to this eternal abode with God. Uh, no waiting for judgment and resurrection of dead and raising of the, uh, you know, uh, gathering together of the, the asleep and all these different ideas that were being posited prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. No, we believe as full preterists, all that Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. Not that now there's nothing, nothing for you when you, you die in this life, but rather everything for you. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. So everything that was in the way of that idea, whether it was the gathering of the asleep, whether it was the resurrection of the dead ones, whether it was judgment, whatever it might have been, that has been done away with. That's been accomplished. And now full access has been given to those that are in the Lord. Uh, and again, in this common day life, in our everyday life, living here on earth, we have full access to the presence and purpose of God. Uh, what is that presence and purpose? Well, the purpose would be an increase to God's kingdom. Uh, that we would see more righteousness, peace, and joy in our land, in our countries, in our areas, in our communities, in our families, in our homes, in our churches. Again, there's so much to be done. An increase to our reality, increase that people would get a better understanding of what God is doing, what God has done. Uh, and then, of course, an increase in knowledge of him. Uh, we read that knowledge, increase in knowledge is one of the things that we need to have regarding our effectual and fruitful use of the knowledge of God. That's 2 Peter chapter 1. So, <laughs> As a full preterist, I hardly believe that it's all ended. I believe there's so much in front of us, so much more that's needed. Uh, and I work toward, I pray toward those realities. Uh, there is not yet a future, there's no yet future resurrection or judgment that's needed for those of us in Christ. The coming of the Lord, the judgment, the resurrection of the dead are events that happen in the past and affect everything about our present reality and future. I think it's so important to, to understand regarding full preterism and that's why i recently wrote that book full preterism proclaiming the presence and purpose of god to kind of narrow down our idea of full preterism to being about the presence and purpose of god so i hope that uh helps you a bit and then also uh eternal truths you know i, I just had a discussion with someone last night talking about eternal truths applicational truths if you will versus contextual truths and I think I mentioned this a bit earlier regarding uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We need to be willing to see that there's a contextual reality to that church at Thessalonica in the first century. The people that would, have received, that would have received that letter. However, there's surely eternal truths that are there as well. And that's our work. Our work is to find the eternal truths, the applicational truths in light of these fulfilled contextual truths. Uh, that are found all throughout the scripture. So uh, I hope we'll see more of that in 2024. And, uh, you know, what I wanted to close out talking about here is um, recently, uh, and if I might ask prayers for a brother named Charles, I'm not going to get his whole government here, but, you know, prayers for him. He created a little conversation on social media recently uh, asking just prayers in regards to his personal life and anything going on with him. Uh, but what I want to highlight here is a post he brought up uh, where he said, uh, who or what determines what is heresy and what is orthodoxy? And he gave us three options. He gave us the Bible, church tradition, creeds, confessions, catechisms, or the Pope. And, uh, you know, I responded the Bible. I know Daniel, uh, another friend here, responded the Bible. Uh, and then Charles challenged that, that a little bit further. Whose interpretation of the, the Bible determines what is heresy and orthodoxy? Uh, and I've experienced that more recently where some local churches, some pastors will say, well, this creed or this tradition or we uh, ourselves declare what is heresy and what is orthodoxy. Uh, much like the Catholic tradition that the church declares what is heresy, uh, not so much the uh, the book. And that was one of the charges brought against Martin Luther in the, uh, you know, in the 15th century, 16th century, excuse me. And uh, so... That's a great question to consider. What, what determines heresy? And then who's in charge of interpreting it and positing it and, and judging it, if you will? Some would posit, uh, I guess, our government leaders here in the United States. Some would posit the pastors in the local church. 
uh, some would posit the Pope, you know, all, all kinds of ideas. So I'm hoping to lead in on some clarity this morning, or this evening, <laughs> this morning. I'm used to preaching in the pulpit. Um, in the New Testament, when we open up the New Testament, this is where we have to start. If we're Bible, going to be Bible-led in our conversation, uh, let's open up to the New Testament and let's ask ourselves, in the New Testament church, how did they declare heresy? What did they mark out as things that they could and could not agree upon? Well, heresy would be, uh, you know, the book of Galatians, right? Uh, I'm astonished that you're turning to another gospel that is not a gospel. Um, that was the Judaizers and their efforts. Um, in Corinth, there was the problem of divisiveness and arrogance and judgmentalism and not judging things that needed to be judged. I've preached on, on the, all of that uh, here at the church. Um you know, so that there were some very divisive things. Now, what we also notice is texts like 1 Corinthians 8 or Romans 14, where there were differences that folks needed to basically just be encouraged to allow the differences, that they had no place for that. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about uh, heresies are necessary uh, within the institution. Uh, that way we can truly see who the, those that are, you know, walking with God, working with God are. Um, so doubling back to 1 Corinthians 8 and Romans 14, uh, both of those texts lead in on the conscience being the, the overall uh, weight of heresy. Uh, you know, so I would again double back to the Bible and I would say, well, in the biblical church, there were differences. It was never unified the way that most folks want it to be unified. Uh, and we need to learn how to become comfortable with that. Maybe that's what the maturity of the church is. Not that we would all agree, but that we would all learn how to disagree well. Uh, you know, and, and that's definitely a, a prayer that I have that the church would learn how to do this. Uh, I don't imagine that everybody will ever come to agree with me 100%, but I, I hope that we can at least work together despite our disagreements. And, and, you know, that's what I've posited as my work within preterism and even within the larger Christian community, Christian church. So um, now let's look at church history a little bit to kind of respond to this question of heresy, because what I'm positing here is in the New Testament, uh, heresy wasn't as cut and dry as we would like it to be. Uh, there were people that were allowed to have disagreements and dis, you know, different perspectives uh, based on doctrines and ideas that they had. Uh, you know, you think of uh, in 1 Corinthians 8, I believe the discussion is about uh, some that believe they can only eat, uh, you know, vegetables, some that believe they could eat meat, meat that had been sacrificed to idols, which again came from theological constructs and ideas. So uh, Paul says, you know, they have to learn how to let each man be convinced in his own mind and work together despite these differences, uh, demonstrating a kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy, as we read in uh, Romans 14, where we also read a little bit about Christian liberty uh, and letting each person be challenged in their own perspective, in their own way. So uh, when we look at the early church, uh, particularly, let's say, the second, first, second century, uh, what we begin seeing is that there were some differences in the churches that, again, you know, there were so many. I know we talk about Jew and Gentile, but the Jewish community was widely divided, and so was the Gentile world. Uh, so um, there was a lot of nuances and differences uh, that would have come to, you know, come to a head in Christian gatherings, kind of like today, uh, or at least what we should wish for and pray for. Uh, but unfortunately, we've inoculated ourselves to that, uh, where we've made it this idea that we all need to agree upon certain things. And um, what we saw was in the next couple centuries, uh, certain assemblies didn't agree with other assemblies. They didn't hereticize each other, but they would say, well, if you're going to do this, then you're going to mingle with this crowd over here. We're not going to hereticize you and say you're not of the faith, but you're not going to be amongst us because amongst us you will be hereticized. So uh, maybe we need to learn how to encourage folks to find others that agree with them or at least find, you know, and, and many know that uh, I talk about, you know, we don't need to leave, flee futurist churches. Uh, rather, we need to find futurist churches that are actually endeavoring to live like Jesus. And uh, same thing for preterist churches uh, and futurists interacting with preterist churches. Uh, I wouldn't say that a futurist shouldn't feel welcomed at a uh, preterist congregation, uh, but they need to make sure that preterist congregation is chasing after a gosp the gospel of Jesus, wanting to do the work of Jesus in our world, allowing people to have uh, their own convictions and their own perspectives and, and urging folks to seek search, study, and proof. So uh, hopefully you see that that's an answer. It, it's not uh, as cut and dry as some folks would want it to be, uh, but that is an answer regarding heresy. Uh, we need to learn how to deal with it. Excuse me. We need to learn how to deal with it in a um, 
corporate setting in a uh, you know a local setting if you will uh and not be so inclined to charge with heresy so i wrote here in some notes um what is needed uh so let's talk about this let's just end on a solution oriented uh point here uh predergate so predergate is happening this inconsistency this demand against growth and progress in the theological world especially regarding bible prophecy it continues uh, folks are just continue to be confused, continue to create false labels regarding the truth of preterism, uh, the power of preterism, as I like to call it. What do we do? Well, consistency and truth in line with God's word needs to be chased after. We need to chase after clarity. Uh, if folks say things, we need to call them to account. You said this. Clarify for me. Uh, it, you know, we need to allow for a greater healing to happen. Uh, that's going to allow for some differences and give people time and allow them, allow truth to have its day and its its heyday, if you will. Uh, and then strategy, ways that we're going to approach people with these truths and ideas and passion, uh, fanning the flame of our faith, uh, being a bit passionate about these things. Uh, these are needed. So uh, I hope that we see that continuing uh, in 2024. Uh, we surely see need to see an end to the heresy charges, and that goes for futurists calling preterists heretics, of course. But then there are some preterists, and myself, I've been there at times, uh, where we're inclined to kind of say our futurist brethren are heretics. Uh, you know, we need to relax. Everybody needs to relax and uh, find our own temperaments and, and relate to the people we can relate to. Uh, and, and, you know, have relationships with people of different ilks and perspectives. That way we can all be reforming each other and growing together. Uh, and then, you know, that leads in on my last point, which would basically be continued discussions, continued debates, and continue review of the different discussions and debates and resources that are out there. So uh, I hope that I've encouraged you in that regard. Uh, Predergate will continue. However, the greater reality is that the power of preterism continues to have its moment within the Christian community. So uh, I'm signing out. Thank you for being here this evening, uh, or this early day, if you will. And uh, I'm Mike Miano. I serve here uh, as apologist through MGW Apologetics. Find and like the Facebook page, MD MGW Apologetics, or visit my blog site, mianogonewild.wordpress.com. Uh, I try to post regularly and give you some things to be thinking about and to be encouraged by. Uh, the Power of Preterism Network. Again, find us on Facebook, like the page, follow the page and or visit powerofpreterism.com, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com. Uh, so many resources that you can gain just by visiting those websites alone. And then, of course, I, I it, would, it would be remiss for me not to mention uh, how grateful I am to serve here as the pastor at the Blue Point Bible Church. You can visit our website, bluepointbiblechurch.org, to learn more about our, our ministry, our efforts, our church. And uh, if you're local, of course, we encourage you to visit with us. We have a host of in-person and online ministry opportunities, most notably uh, Sermon Sunday, as I like to call it. And we have a service at 1030 a.m. Eastern in person here at the Blue Point Bible Church in Blue Point, New York. And then we have a 6 p.m. session where we go through an order of prayer and encourage and build one another up in that session as well. So uh, that's my work. I'm signing out. And if I may just conclude this session this evening with a rendering of the fulfilled Our Father as I like to pray it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom has come, your will has been done, on earth as it is in heaven. You have given us our daily bread and have forgiven us of our trespasses, as we continue to forgive those who trespass against us. And you've led us not into temptation, but have delivered us from evil. For yours are the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless and go in peace. Thank you for being here this evening.